Welcome back to Season 5 of CX in the Wild, where we capture conversations with the leading voices of customer experience from around the world. All right, let's start out with who you are and what you do. Thanks. I'm Judy Raven, and I'm the president and co-founder of an organization called Accents International. And at Accents International, we help people be understood. Our mission is to create a world where everyone is heard. We feel that everyone has a voice and everyone deserves to be heard. So we go about that in two different ways. We teach people who speak English as an additional language, aka English as a second language, but we prefer the term English as an additional language. We teach people how to pronounce the sounds in English that don't occur in their first language. For people who speak any language, including English, we also teach accent comprehension. It's the flip side of English pronunciation. We teach people how to understand heavily accented speech, accent comprehension. That program is called Inclusive Listening, Tuning Your Ears to Accents. So I like to have interesting guests on the show, and I'm already feeling like you're going to be one of the most interesting guests this year. So Uh everything you said, I want to share a personal story about communication. It's not about enunciation or listening. However, helping people be heard and understood, the moment it hit me how important this really is, is I was in Italy changing some US dollars and I was there with my wife and the, the, the person exchanging the bills had a textbook open, a dictionary open, yes. they were reading and they were speaking to us in the English, it was, it's, it was good English and they said, hey, you're, are you American? And I said, yes, of course. Uh, they said, can you help me with my English assignment. And I was like, I got this. Hit me, what is it? <clears throat> they said, what does the phrase mean, hung out to dry? Oh my goodness gracious. Wow. Yeah. So I consider myself fairly competent with slang and, and I started to try to empathize and put my, myself in their shoes, hung out to dry and trying to explain left hanging or, you know, it, it's not Without as, using other idioms. How do you explain it without using other idioms? 100%. So to your point, the reason I'm suddenly excited to talk to you is because being heard and, and being able to communicate, it's never as easy as people like to say, you can't just shout your language louder and slower. Exactly. And Dennis, English pronunciation is hard and it is not the person, it's the language. So Dennis, can I ask you a question? Of course. Great. Can you give me a few words with the letter O? In the middle or? Anywhere. Just words that have a letter O in it. Sure. More. More. Good. How. How. Wonder. A. Wonder. Good. What did you drink? Honorous. Honorous. And the H is solemn. Good. Coke. Coke. What did you drink in the morning? Maybe. Coffee. Good. So we have seven different pronunciations of the letter O. And one of the least common is O. And the most common is A. Followed by A. Like profit and common and follow and on top and not. And it goes on and on and on. It's not the person, it's the language. So, yes. So, that's what we do. So, you solve for that. And try to, yes. And how do you turn that into a business model? (laughs) Right. Right. So, we work with companies whose global workforce are fluent English speakers, English speakers, but maybe it's not their first language. English might be their second or third or fourth language. We like the term They speak English as an additional language. And we teach people how to pronounce the sounds in English that don't exist in their first language. And literally, what are we doing with our tongue and our teeth and our lips and our jaw? Does it look like? What does it feel like? 
The goal is not to sound the same. It's a 10 hour program. That's it. Because the goal is not that we sound the same. The goal is that we become as effective as possible. Wouldn't it be terrible if we all sounded the same and eliminate our cultural identity? No, that's not good. But what is good is that no one has to hear what? What did you say? Can you repeat that? Or worse, let me talk with somebody who speaks English. They do speak English. Just that, not, that's yeah. really kind of be one of the worst demoralizing oh, it's demoralizing in our industry. I'm going to I'm going to actually write a blog post it about that. It is so demoralizing. It's so demoralizing. <clears throat> and you know, in terms of I'm trying to think of a good word, maybe empowering people with so when we teach contact center agents. I mean, we work with indi- all kinds of industries and contact centers is one of them, but one of the best feedback stories that I love to hear is when people say, you know, after our, our training, in the evenings, I taught my wife or husband, I taught my kids everything you taught us so that they can, they can be heard with more respect, more dignity, and more impact, that they can take it and run with it. That's kind of why we do what we do, Dennis. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. It really is so it, gratifying. I was just as mentioned in Africa, and they tried to teach me how to say some things in Africa, and they made sounds that I could not make. Exactly. It wasn't easy. It's not easy. It is not easy. It's certainly not, pronunciation is not intuitive. I mean, after a certain age, after teenage years, it's not intuitive. We have to literally be taught. What are, we have to tell our mouth what to do. I have tried so many online YouTube mm-hmm. videos about how to speak. In all my YouTube videos, I have a, a filter that I have to use to DS my speech because I have like this little S in a lot of my speech. I've got to get rid of that. But yeah. I don't I, hear it, by the way. Maybe maybe you will as we go on, or maybe it's just when I'm in my YouTube studio. And you know what, Dennis? I also have a little bit of a lisp. Can you hear my lisp? And now I that think, you call attention to it. And I've decided not to eliminate it, because the point is that we don't sound the same. The point that. is that we are effective, that we can convey our thoughts, our ideas, our feelings, and our expertise. I feel like you just boosted my YouTube confidence by a point, (laughs) which I sense is partly why you got into this. How did you get into this business? Thank you for asking. It's, um, well, I didn't have, I really didn't, it wasn't in my game plan. But what happened was way back in my early 20s, I spent some time in France. I did a junior year abroad. So I was 20, actually, 20 and 21. And when I got to France, I thought I was a fluent French speaker. My vocabulary, my grammar, I took, I passed all the tests that said I spoke French, but there wasn't a speaking component to that test. And even my own family who lived there kept saying, what, 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 I don't understand. And that's when I realized, oh, pronunciation, it's key to every language. And so it was really being on the other side of the street. And the more people said to me in French in that situation, what? Can you repeat it that? Or gave me a blank stare or smiled and I had I knew they didn't know what I was saying. So when I returned to the States, I decided I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to help other people so they don't have to feel this terrible sense of unempowerment. That, that story is so real. My wife speaks French and my son speaks French. Oh, really? And I can't even tell you the snobbish times in our house because French is a language that demands oh, the right sounds. Absolutely. We'll, we'll be watching television and there'll be a story and somebody will say something in French and my wife and son will look over and say, it's wo, not <laughs> zo. And I'm like, what? They said, yeah, they said something totally different because they didn't have the <laughs> like, it's so true. And these sounds that, so there's the, the word sound. We know what sound means. Phoneme is a sound that gives meaning to a word. So for example, in English, we have this phoneme or th, th, th. In other languages, 
That doesn't mean anything. In English, it gives meaning to the word the, or this, or thank you, or whatever. So all of these phonemes, these sounds, le, in French, we don't have that in English. But it gives meaning to words in French. It's fine if your phone rings. It's called CX Noir for a reason, Judy. Sorry. No, th this is real life. I can't even tell you how many times oh, I've had people walk in on these. Forgot to turn off my phone. That's totally. Sorry about that, Dennis. It, this is okay. This is what makes it authentic. I'm, you know, I'm good with vowels and consonants. Technology, not, not so much. You know what? This is why I do the show this way. Very similar. I think what we have in common is, for me, it's not about the production. It's not about getting the podcast done. It's about just getting to know you. It's, this happens in real life. Phones ring. Oh, thank so you. I'm thank just you. grateful for you to be on the show. Thank you. Tell me about, <clears throat> take me from, you had this experience in France and you recognize, but even then, sis, that's a big jump to build a business around it. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, thank you. So I was teaching English pronunciation at Eastern Michigan University at the time. It was the late 90s. And it really drove me crazy that there weren't any learning materials for my students. Mm. So I got to be in my bonnet and I started working with a local software developer and I had them build for me a, at the time it was this really she, she, high-end learning tool called an interactive DVD. Wow. wow. One of those silver things? Yes. And people put it in their PC. Nobody had a laptop back then. And up came these video demonstrations and audio. And it was really, actually, it was really cool. And there was some feedback to it. And lo and behold, um, and I wrote, and it, it, okay, so that was a nice piece of software, and I wrote a book to go along with it. And um, it got picked up by PR, no, by, oh, what was the, a few different um, media organizations, CompuWorld.com, yes. CNN.com. Somehow word got on the street. So that was great. And then word got on the street, and I was teaching at Eastern, and I got a phone call from General Motors Powertrain, the plant. Hey, we've got some people here. They're really struggling with English pronunciation. Can you come and, you know, help them out? Sure, I'd love to. And then word spread among the auto industry. And then all of a sudden I was working with, um, went from General Motors to some of the tier one suppliers. Um, Federal mogul. Nah. Hmm. To, anyway, different tier one suppliers. And then I put in a leave of absence from Eastern Michigan University and opened up my first LLC. And I decided, you know what? Let's just see what, let's just see what kind of an impact this could have. And so I did that. Um, and then I was, this is the best networking. I mean, I, I just meet the greatest people up at the bar, Dennis. So I'm at, up at the bar at a networking event at uh, Comerica Park the tiger's den. This was back before. Um, and I meet someone, this is 2005. Uh, he's the CEO of a software development company called Menlo Innovations. And we're talking and he said, Oh, I really like that idea. How about if I buy your company? And I, I said, what? And he said, yeah, we can really create some nice software together. So six months later, I sell my first company. They acquire it. We join forces and we continue to build software around English pronunciation. We built a beautiful program for NATO, which they licensed and own. Actually, we co-own that, NATO and this current company. And then in 2014, um, Menlo was going in a different direction, and we decided we want to still stay with Trin. Anyway, we hugged and kissed goodbye. We're still great friends, and we did a spin-out, and this is my third iteration. I purchased the assets back, and uh, this is Accents International. So really, I had no business going into business. My background is academia. One of my first business meetings, someone asked if they could take a look at my P&L statement, and I gave them a look, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, you know what, we don't even have an NDA. We'll, we'll, we'll wait on that. And afterwards, I had to look up what a P&L state, what did P&L, P and, what did P&L stand for? What did NDA stand for? I came from academia. I had no idea what I was getting into, but it worked. 
because you were focused on the value. And this hits home for me just because I've been going around the world talking to call center agents. And so many of them want to enunciate. Yes. And, and, and they, want, they, they don't view it as a, a disrespect to their culture. They, they view it as a, a path of for making themselves, empowering themselves for their careers. It, it really is. It's, um, I wish that the industry term was not accent reduction. It's a gross misnomer. Really, it's accent acquisition, or just if we call it what it really is, it's English pronunciation. Just like I wanted to learn French pronunciation, I'm learning German now, I want to learn German pronunciation. It's just an aspect of any language. Grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation. I covered a story <clears throat> last year about a technology that it uses AI, text-to-speech, to circumvent the accent. Yes. And, and while I think that t there's a great example of maybe scale. Yes. But I don't think that that's where the world's going, Judy. Mm -hmm. I think the world is going to be more and more human over the next few years. Uh, so I really love thank you. that there's someone like you actually doing it for real. And giving people a gift instead of circumventing them. Thank you, Dennis. You know, I appreciate you saying that. Some of our clients use that. They use that exact app along with what we do for a couple of reasons. One, because the better the pronunciation going into it, the more effective the AI. But the other reason is many agents don't want to use that because it doesn't sound like themselves and it takes away their own voice. And so at least the clients that we work with, they give people the choice. And agents can say, no, that's not for me. It doesn't sound like me, I wanna sound like me. That's so yeah. nice. And I hope that our world is moving more to a humanistic approach. I will tell you that I just, I just uh, joined an advisory board that'll be announced um, soon. Oh, good. And Congratulations. Thank you. And, and one of the, the, the reasons was because when they talked to me about the future of AI and call center agents or customer experiences, I described a world where AI is not something to be afraid of, but it's something that will significantly change the way businesses work so that the human characteristics yes. of each individual become more and more rare or more and more valuable as we move forward. That being a human with a lisp or a, for me, I don't even know what it's called when I, having you really pointed that out, having our identities is part of the empathetic equation. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. And we have to be able to bring our identity with us wherever we go. We can't, we shouldn't have to hide who we are. Now, yeah, yes. And so in your program, how does it scale? Mm. That's a, thank you for asking that question. So there are a few different ways. In terms of scaling the program, we do a train the trainer pro for call centers for, for contact centers. Which term do you prefer? Uh, I'm open. Okay. I okay, great. So for, for agents of that, um, we do a train the trainer where we teach their trainers how to teach what we do. We give them the methodology and a curriculum. Then we shadow them teaching the agents, give them feedback so they get it just right. And then they become the force multiplier then they can train a 1,000 agents, 2,000 agents, because for us to do that, that's really expensive. And that's not our goal. Our goal is to make people independent. So then they take it and they run with it. The other way to scale it is that we do have a standalone product for self-study where people just log in. It's effective. People make 55 60% improvement as opposed to 85 90% improvement. I love that you have, a, I like to call it the plant and grow strategy. 
you know, planting the knowledge in an organization. Just curious, feel free if you can't disclose something like this, but because I've been talking to so many uh, call centers. Yes. How is it cost prohibitive to 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 train the trainer? Like no, how much is it? Can no, you, I'm can happy you? to talk about how much it costs. It costs anywhere between, depending on how much you want to customize it. It can cost anywhere between fifteen thousand to forty thousand, and I wouldn't go with the forty thousand dollar option. It's not worth it. So, you can get a great, great, great mm-hmm. ROI for fifteen twenty thousand dollars. So what I hear you saying, correct me where I'm wrong, if I have a call center yes, and I pay this $20,000 yes, to train four trainers, oh, not geez. one trainer. So, okay. So it's for $20,000, you somehow come in and make four people in that organization. Right language modifiers right to create a closer connection between the yes. knowledgeable agents and the customers yes. of the in brands their own that voice. they serve in their own voice so they can keep their sense of humor and their yes. their their pitch and inflection exactly. for happiness exactly and so we did our train the trainer program in March and the metrics are coming back now where their average handling time goes down by 18%. And their conversion rate goes up by 64% to new. Yeah. And these are the people who are reading to their kids at night, teaching that. So we made a decision a long time ago, for better or for worse. But I think it's for better. My 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 dad might think it's for worse because <laughs> you know he's a and that is, we can teach a whole lot of people for less money, or we can teach fewer people for more money. And we'd rather, we'd rather create these force multipliers. It feels good. So, God, you're just pulling it all on my heartstrings right now because that twenty thousand uh, dollars. I don't know how authentic it sounds when you say it, but I'm going to say it. When you teach four people in Africa or in some anywhere for for people to go in and train their che- teams to enable their voice and to be heard and all those stats whatever you're also impacting maybe one or two generations of that family which that is there's not a metric for that. There's no number we can it's, throw out. I that, hope so. I hope it's that impactful. So these four trainers. Whoa, 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 whoa. As the, as the, 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 the owner of this, you, I love that you hope it's that impactful. I come from an immigrant family. We lost our accent over the, over three generations in this country. We worked at it. And Japanese families, one of the things that's interesting about demographics is you can't target Japanese people in any country, anywhere in the world outside of Japan, because our philosophy of being part of the group means that the minute we immigrate, we instantly start to shed the things that differentiate us from the collective. So there is a high emphasis on getting rid of mm. these things. And so when you say, I hope it affects generations to come, it absolutely, it has everything to do with how a family acclimates when they immigrate into a new country and the success that follows down the line. My grandfather came here. My dad went to um, high school here. My children are the first to go to college. Oh. And it's because of the fact that we've learned to adapt and, and, and thrive. And when you can't adapt and your voice can't be heard. That's the thing. When your voice can't be heard, you are stuck. You're stuck. There's no forward movement. So thank you. I, I do want to meant to clarify the four trainers then yeah. can train an unlimited number of oh, agents. Yeah. 
So I, I, that's part of the program. Yes. And then let's say one of those trainers moves to another company. Okay. The other trainers can train their replacement. So yes. th that's um, when you asked about scaling. I wanted to close that loop in case I didn't explain that well. I'm glad you did. I took that from the conversation okay. because it's clear for me even just in this little bit that I've gotten to know, know you, your, your, we have so many similarities. You're really trying to do the job you do, but what's most important to you is that it grows beyond you oh. and helps other people. Um, Dennis, I did not coin this expression and probably you've heard it, but I really love this expression rather than to kill two birds with one stone. Really, the goal is to feed lots of birds with one seed. Just let's feed lots of birds wow. with one seed. Yeah, that's let's do amazing. it. Amazing. So, you 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 were mentioning that you're just now starting to get a lot of interest yes. from customer care centers. Or... Right. I I. It's shocking to me. It's surprising. I've been doing this last month. It was our 25 year anniversary in the field of English pronunciation training. And my first call came last year of the, 20, of the past 25 years. My first inquiry came last year and they keep coming. So somehow the word is spreading and grateful to be able to be of service to this industry. Let me, let me tell you about Arena CX. Do you know about Arena no. CX? Arena CX is here at this conference. Oh. And the CEO is, and if I can get you two to talk, Here's what's interesting about Arena CX. They are, they're standardizing the BPO industry. Okay. So standardizing from a compliance perspective, yes. an onboarding perspective, a technology perspective, uh, and legalities, comp, uh, uh, compliance procurement, so that BPOs in, in a full spectrum of countries worldwide have enough similarities and dispositions in the economy that a brand can say, I, I need a BPO in Argentina and I need one in, in the Philippines and they can get standardized services. But what's interesting about that is this standardization, the halo that it creates is a smaller, lower barrier of entry and more rapid inclusion of, let's say, deaf call center agents who can, who can work. That's or, great. Or, or I spoke to them this morning about refugees. Oh my gosh. So they, they're creating a worldwide network of these sorts of services and your your whole ethos of what you're doing is it's consistent with what they're doing. They're not trying to maximize efficiencies to get profits, to get to scale. All these tech bro terms that have sort of disenchanted so many human beings. This is a group who's just trying to standardize quality services oh and gosh. access around the I world. Love and I love that. I feel like you're, you, you would have in that ecosystem a place because you're not trying to reap from the system. What you would do is plant seeds all throughout the world that could continue I would love to their mission with the, I'd as well. love to partner with them and support their mission. Don't you find, Dennis, actually I think I know the answer to this, that serving people who serve others is, like, and I hate to sound like a, well, like, well, we're all friends here. <laughs> Don't you just think it's awesome? It yes. is so awesome. It really is a certain kind of gratification that is just helping other, serving people who serve others is, it's amazing. My, my one, because I'm Japanese and was raised in a Japanese household, we, we are predispositioned to be subservient to anyone above us. It's the face culture. Um, but in the most positive ways. And I think it's because, not subserving in a bad way, but service to order that's positive for the group. Is that's the, 
And I would say, and my, my uncle who raised me, he was in the Vietnam War. He was a medic. Really? And it was very traumatic for him. Yeah, you can sure. only imagine. And when he came back and he was raising me, I talked to him about it. And I was like, were you afraid? He said, yes. I said, was it horrible? He was like, yes. And, you know, I was like, how should I process that? How did you process it? And he said, Dennis, as you go through life, when there's a crisis, car accident, war, this, that, or the other thing, you're gonna, you look around and there's going to be two types of people, those who are helping and those who are not. Be a helper. That was enough for me. Hit me at a formidable time of my life. Wow. Wow. But it that sounds is, like you're very that similar. That is mentoring at its finest. Your uncle sounds like a very fine person. He, he, he's, he's a great guy. So you, I think we've established quite a bit in this conversation. Judy, thank you for joining oh, me on this podcast. Oh, thanks go to podcast. you. Thank you. Thank you. Your mission of, can you just repeat it for me one more time about yep. being heard? Yep. And so our mission is cre- to create a world where everyone is heard. Creating a world where everyone is heard. That's wonderful. Yep. And, and give me the, thank you. Give me the PC, the new language that we should all be using about. Oh, rather than English as a second language. Nope. Oh, the other one. Uh, accent acquisition. Yes. Accent acquisition. And what, or simply English pronunciation or just pronunciation. And what do people say? Accent reduction. Accent reduction. And what, what, so, what, is, you know, that was what coined, an unpopular. Yeah, I know. It, because it sounds like something is wrong. Yeah. There's nothing to fix. You know, we have a faculty member. Is this okay that I, I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you? Okay. We have an, one of our instructors. Just look. When we were interviewing her years ago. This was the only question that needed to be asked. She said, I never talk about accent reduction as therapy or something that needs to be fixed. An accent is a speech pattern, not a speech problem. Yeah. And it's true. It, and gonna, we all have an accent. I'm gonna we be all honest. have an accent. It's inappropriate to say accent reduction. It really is. You know, it's, it's something that the um, linguists developed, I want to say back in the I see. 80s, in a world where accent was a phonological term. It didn't have any feeling around politics or identity. It, an accent meant pronunciation. An accent meant vowels, consonants, syllable stress, rhythm. But it doesn't mean that anymore. So it's a real problem, Dennis, because how do people find the service they plug in accent reduction? That's how they find it. But well, really, it's accent acquisition. Accent acquisition. I will definitely highlight that in my content. Thank you. Judy, thank you so much oh, for being on the so podcast Oh, thank you so much. The thanks today. go to you. Dennis, thank you for what you do. It really is a gift. Thanks for tuning in to CX in the Wild. If you'd like to be on the show, connect with us through the link in the description or DM Dennis on LinkedIn. 